This is episode 75 of the Fitness and Post podcast. To access the show notes for this episode, please visit fitnessandpost.com slash 75. After listening to this episode, if you're interested in giving one of True Brain's products a try, you can visit our special link, fitnessandpost.com slash truebrain, and that's true, just T-R-U, and you can use the code fitness for 25% off your first order. Again, that's fitnessandpost.com slash T-R-U-B-R-A-I-N. My name is Zach Arnold. I'm a film and television editor and the creator of Fitness and Post. I've spent many years working brutally long hours in a dark room and battled numerous health problems due to the sedentary nature of my career, and that's what led me to building Fitness and Post. Whether you work in post-production like me, or if you're a designer, programmer, animator, composer, or anyone working a sedentary job all day, we'll help you learn how to sit less, focus more, eat better, and bring health and wellness back into your life. You spend all day fixing it in post. Now it's time for some fitness in post. Hello, and welcome to the Fitness in Post podcast, where it is my mission to help you optimize the most powerful operating system that you have yourself. My guest today is Dr. Andrew Hill, who holds a PhD in cognitive neuroscience from UCLA and is the lead neuroscientist for a company called TrueBrain that creates high quality nootropic products that help you enhance your cognitive function, mental stamina, and your focus. As my listeners know, I love talking about brain science, and in this episode, we go deep into how the brain works when it comes to focus and attention. We also talk extensively about the difference between smart drugs and nootropics, which are safe, and which you should be afraid of and why. But before we get to our interview, I'd like to announce that beta enrollment is still open for my online course, Move Yourself, but it's going to be closing this Friday, April 8th at midnight Pacific time, and the price is going to go up for the next release. So if you're interested in joining and you're hearing this announcement before April 8th, visit fitnessandpost.com slash optimize for more info. That's fitnessandpost.com slash O-P-T-I-M-I-Z-E. If you're new to this podcast, Move Yourself is an online learning course like lynda.com but for your health that contains five modules and over 25 lessons of educational content that will show you how to sit less, focus more, and become so active at work that you're never going to feel guilty for skipping the gym again. And in addition to over five hours worth of lessons, the course also contains over 50 activity videos from certified chiropractors and yoga instructors, and even a few from yours truly, that will help you alleviate the chronic pains associated with being sedentary all day long and will give you more energy throughout the day. Again, if this course interests you, visit fitnessandpost.com slash optimize for more info. And if you're listening after April 8th, you can always visit fitnessandpost.com slash optimize and get yourself on the waiting list. And now, without further ado, my conversation with Dr. Andrew Hill. Okay, I am here today with Dr. Andrew Hill, lead neuroscientist at True Brain, as well as the founder of Peak Brain. So, Andrew, it is a pleasure to have you on the podcast today. Great. Thanks for having me, Zach. Well, as I was telling you a little bit offline before we started recording the conversation, and as my audience knows, for those that are longtime listeners, I am a giant neuroscientist geek. I love talking brain science. I have no formal training in it, but I read about it a lot. I've experimented with neurofeedback. I've experimented with several different nootropics, including True Brain. And I just, I'm always on the lookout for ways to enhance cognitive function as long as it's not dangerous and crazy and there's all kinds of risks. But if there are ways that I can enhance my focus and just be able to do my creative job better, I'm looking for ways to do that. So that's why it's it's so exciting to have you on the show today. That sounds like a goal everyone should have to hack and take control of their brain. And uh, I mean, why would we not want to do that? Why, if, if there's things within reach and we have a problem, there's a reason to do it. And if there's things within reach and we don't have any things to remediate, why would we also not you know, seek enhancement? Yeah, I agree. And I'm not going to go down. Um, there's so many rabbit holes that I could go down about why people – don't have the focus that they used to, how diet is affecting us, how lack of mobility and lack of movement is affecting your cognitive function. Those are things that I talk about at other podcasts. Really, today is going to be about 
the science of the brain, digging into smart drugs, digging into nootropics, and really understanding what people can do to enhance their cognitive function. And if we have time, it's kind of like a bonus round. I really want people to understand what's happening with the brain when you sleep and what's happening if you're not getting enough of it. So that, those are kind of the takeaways that I'm hoping that we can walk away with today. Sounds great. Let's see how many of those we can tackle. Awesome. Well, let's get started just so people have a little bit of a background with your knowledge, your schooling, and kind of how, how you got to the point where you worked for True Brain and all the things we're going to talk about tonight. Sure. So I have a PhD from UCLA from the Department of Psychology studying cognitive neuroscience. So I sort of do a lot of research, education, and uh, clinical work at the intersection of mind and brain, or what ultimately for me has been about analyzing, assessing, uh, training the brain to figure out how the mind works and to enhance its function, to enhance, for, for me, it's performance, things like attention, uh, sleep, stress, some developmental things at both ends of the life course. I, I teach courses at UCLA now on gerontology, neuroscience, psychology. I also do uh, clinical work at Peak Brain Institute where I have a neurofeedback a practice. We do QEG brain mapping and some research. Several years ago, helped True Brain uh, uh, develop the initial rounds of products and I continue to help them sort of scientifically vet uh, ingredients and figure out effects on the brain. So I'm their lead neuroscientist. So I've got my hands in, you know, consumer as well as education, as well as research and clinical uh, realms, but it's all the same thrust that I, I started on when I went into grad school about, uh, you know, a little over 10 years ago. It's, it's about finding ways to enhance our function to, to you know, the, so the, the rant I started off the, uh, the podcast with for you today was, was uh, really at the core of why, would we, you know, why do we not want to understand or, or how, how can we understand, you know, more, more positively, how can we understand what's going on functionally and how can we take control? How can we, I mean, that's trying to understand how the mind and brain work is the play space of every cognitive neuroscientist, every person working in the wet brain space, the wet mind space. So much of what we are learning scientifically and in labs uh, historically over the past 20, 30, 40 years has taken such a long time to translate into practical application. And, and with a bunch of things sort of in today's milieu, you know, technologically and educationally and, and a rapid uh, pace of everything from economic pressure to Moore's law, which is also partially economic, we, we, you know, we have such an opportunity now to bring tools and technologies to, to our fingertips and to figure out, to, to, to hold a mirror up and to look in our brains and figure out how we work and to figure out what's going on. And so it's things like that that really, you know, drew me in through that whole process of getting a PhD, which is, you know, a little bit annoying and um, getting into the space and doing these sort of slightly divergent things. That's a slightly long, a long winded answer about my background, but I think it frames what, you know, what I'm all about pretty well. So Absolutely. And I think the very short version, the cliff notes are, you've got your hands in a lot of different brains. I do. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're, you're definitely a brain guy. We have definitely established that. As much as I want to just jump right into talking about smart drugs and nootropics and all this other cool stuff, I want to give people a little bit of a background, just kind of brain science 101, brain waves 101. And for those of you that have listened to this podcast and are longtime listeners, you know that I've actually done this two or three times in the past with a another friend of mine and neuroscientist, Dr. Michael Mark, and I'm going to put links to those episodes in the show notes because we do a super deep dive into what neurofeedback is, how neurofeedback can affect brain waves. But just for those that are new listeners, can we just kind of get the, the elevator pitch version of kind of how brain waves work, how a QEEG measures them, and then we can use that to connect into our conversation about smart drugs? Sure. So uh, essentially, brain electrical activity is complicated and chaotic. We don't fully understand it, but there's a lot of information, a lot of data, a lot of stuff going on, and a lot of brain activity can be picked up with scalp electrodes. And so we're picking up these oscillations, these bursting and firing patterns of groups of uh, you know, cell assemblies, 30,000 massive bundles of cells that have all the same electrical output, and they fire these, these rhythmic patterns. And we know these patterns are different assemblies in the brain coming together and coordinating their activity temporarily often, and then, you know, joining other parties and doing other dances and other rhythms with other, other people, other modes and, and nodules in the brain. But these, these transient ongoing rhythms do all kinds of things to keep stuff happening, like autonomic stuff that we're not aware of, like our heart beating and our, our lungs moving. 
um, as well as the content of thought, which happens often in the cortex. And you can measure different frequencies, and conventionally we call them things like going from slow to fast, delta, theta, alpha, beta, and gamma. And those are not in order of the Greek alphabet, of course, because alpha was discovered first, even though it's sort of in the middle of the conventional brainwave range, around 10 hertz, 10 cycles per second. Starting really slow, we have delta around zero to two or three hertz, and uh, maybe one to, one to three, one to four hertz, something like that. These are somewhat arbitrary divisions, and they change a little bit person to person, but delta is mostly a, uh, a deep restorative auto automatic frequency. It runs the lungs, the heart, can maybe have me have some delta uh, influence. Deltas involve a slow wave sleep and that sort of deep washing, that car wash that happens when the cerebral spinal fluid uh, sort of you know whisks toxins away from cellular matter, uh, brain matter. And that's you know delta is not really a cognitive frequency. You don't want to do a lot of it with your cortex when you're wide awake with your eyes open. In fact, if you see delta with the eyes open, wide awake, you 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 think cortex damage often. And then theta is the next frequency up, four to seven. Theta is involved with uh, uh, sort of wide focus, including things like creativity, abstract thought, pulling memories out of your mind, uh, some evidence that memory access may be a six and a half or seven hertz frequency uh, specifically, but somewhere in that neighborhood. But theta is also not especially driven or focused. And so excesses of theta, uh, especially frontal excesses of theta, are often seen as a failure of inhibition. And then you have things like emotional liability or reactivity, you have impulsivity, you know, hyperactivity, everything from ADHD to sometimes like anxiety can be a, a slow, excess in slow waves, these theta waves. But they're also useful for things like deep hypnagogic creative access and flow states can maybe have some access. And you know, meditators have been doing a lot of meditation for many, many years. Mm -hmm will take their higher frequencies and drag them down sometimes into the theta frequency band. So, you know, this stuff's not quite so simple as the band suggests, but broadly it's access states as well as impulsivity in the theta range. And then alpha is uh, 8 to 12. And uh, 8 to 10 alpha, which is often alpha 1 or low alpha, is inactive cortex, idling tissue. You close your eyes and the visual cortex in the back of the head goes into alpha because there's nothing for the visual cortex to process typically with your eyes closed, at least the primary visual cortex. You open your eyes and the visual cortex alpha one uh, should get blocked and be replaced with beta, the next frequency up, if your visual cortex is processing. And a couple of things can be said about those frequencies in that context. If you close your eyes and your visual, uh, your V1, your, your primary occipital uh, cortex that processes the, the input of the retina, does not go idle, does not go into alpha one, and it it's, remains in beta, then we typically think of that as hypervigilance. You're scanning the environment visually, even with nothing coming in visually. That's sort of keeping the gain wide open in your sensory system uh, visually, just in case. And when you see that uh, in a brain map, you often think sort of, uh, you know, anxiety or hypervigilant markers, you know, your feelers are up. Alpha two, the next frequency up, is around 10 to 12. And there's some evidence that alpha two is involved with flow states and access to quick thoughts. Also, fast alpha, having your alpha itself, the broad alpha, be at a faster average frequency, is related to cognitive processing speed. And as you get old, your alpha actually slows down. When you get, as you develop from a kid to an adult, it speeds up as your brain myelinates, and the average processing speed of neurons starts to speed up, and the alpha speed is, sort of indexes that. And then when you get old, around 65 to 75 to 80, you end up with alpha that's slower. It has slowed down because um, even though you've continued to myelinate most of your life, you're losing cell bodies now after about you know, 60, 65. Somewhere in there, you might start losing a significant amount of cell bodies, enough to slow the speed of your average firing rates. Um, and so you look at these things and you think, you know, fast alpha, slow alpha, developmental markers. You also think of it as sort of the idle speed of your mind because it's the rest mode at which you are, you know, from which you are acting cognitively. And uh, ultimately you can, you can look at the speed of alpha and, and maybe even infer someone's quickness. And if alpha is faster than average for adult people, alpha is around 10 hertz, 10 cycles per second. On average, if it's much faster than that, you're, you're probably either really intelligent, really anxious, or both. And then above alpha, around 12 to 15, we have low beta, which when it occurs on the sensory motor strip, when your motor system is idle, we would call SMR or sensory motor rhythm. 
which is the core of neurofeedback, at least historically. And then we have other beta frequencies above that, or, uh, you know, 15 to 18 to 15 to, you know, probably 38 would be considered beta conventionally. There's different functional cognitive frequencies in there. You can think of it as gears going, you know, running gears in a car. Uh, and as you get faster and faster, you're doing, you know, much faster firing, much faster frequencies. And your mind's also doing much faster things. And so as you get up there in frequencies, fast frequencies, sometimes those things are problematic. You know, spindles and the fast frequencies bursts sort of show up often as little frictions of anxiety or fear or sensation. And then above that, conventionally, we stop at around gamma, which is 38 to probably 200, actually. But conventionally, it's 38 to about 42 or 44. And gamma appears to be a slightly mysterious frequency. It may be involved in things like the binding of conscious uh, perception into the moment of experience. The evidence for that sounds really lofty. The evidence for that is twofold. One, um, certain studies show that schizophrenics have decreased coherence or gamma sort of coupling or connectivity across the scalp, across the cortex rather, in a way that uh, might be correlated with symptom severity of sort of reality testing. And uh, conversely, long-term 20, 30-year meditators, some of some studies show have in- enhanced uh, gamma production and uh, coherence or coupling across the cortex. So that's your thumbnail sketch uh, going from slow to fast. And we don't, that's about, you know, we, we, we know more than that, a lot more than that, and it gets more complex, but we really don't know everything. And it's a bit of an epiphenomenological study to some extent, EEG. We, we describe what we see and we, we infer what might be happening. We get closer to understanding things, but, you know, in cognitive neuroscience research, we're always trying to scratch our heads and interpret things. In QEG clinically, we're, you know, the QEG, as I'm sure uh, your other guests clarified, is not, strictly speaking, diagnostic. You know, you can't look at a brain and go, aha, you have this. But you can say, oh, that thing you're describing, it's right here, often. Because people's symptoms often cross diagnostic boundaries, and also what's problematic for one person is not problematic for someone else. And so there's a certain amount of, you know, it's likely this pattern we're seeing in your QEG is related to some functional issue in impulsivity or speed of thought or anxiety. And there's, you know, dozens of patterns like that. But a lot of unusual is normal. The QEG diagnostically uh, or, you know, prognostically ends up being informative more than definitive, so to speak. Nice. Well, now my entire audience can qualify themselves as neuroscientists because I think that is an excellent, excellent overview of the different uh, spectrum of brain waves. And I think the two takeaways that I want the audience to get from this now that we're all professional uh, PhDs in neuroscience and understand the entire spectrum of brain waves is that number one, your brain waves are measurable. So when you're thinking, oh, well, it's just about how I feel and I I just am kind of depressed or I'm unfocused or I have ADD, these are things that are very measurable. And when you have a QEEG, you can look at the brain waves. And like you said, you can't diagnose something, but you have a much clearer picture than a psychoanalyst saying, well, how do you feel today? Okay, well, here's a pill. And I went through that process, and then I went through the neurofeedback process, doing QEEGs, doing 3D brain maps, when somebody could say, hey, here's a spot that's really red. Did anything happen here? Well, gee, yes, I got hit in the head with a baseball when I was in high school. So we started working on that area, and magically, things like anxiety, ADD, depression, all these things started to go away in no way that a pill could fix, because the pills don't fix things, they just cover the symptoms. But that, that's not really where I want to go too much today, but that's that's one takeaway that I wanted the audience to get from that. The other is that because we have these specific brainwave frequencies, where I completely want to go into the rabbit hole today is focus. My The whole thing that I'm trying to do right now with the online courses that I'm building with my program is help people learn how to focus more. And in my opinion, the best smart drug on the planet, so to speak, for better cognitive function and more focus is just movement. It's moving throughout the day. It's exercising more. And that's something that I cover a lot. But now I want to go to that next level where somebody says, all right, I'm moving a lot and I exercise and I'm feeling pretty good. Now, how do I go to the next level, which I guess we could go, we could call like the limitless level. Everybody knows the Bradley Cooper film Limitless. And People are either fascinated by it or terrified by it. <laughs> so that being the case, and people kind of getting some Hollywood, you know, Hollywoodized version of what smart drugs can do to your brain, I, w- I want to start talking about smart drugs versus nootropics versus you know things that go even deeper. And I want to start 
because this is a very common question that I know a lot of people in the, this industry have, is the smart drug versus the nootropic. And I want to start from the simple end of the spectrum, which is the most common and most proven smart drugs in the history of the planet, which are coffee and nicotine. Coffee and cigarettes are what got us most of the great novels of the last five centuries. So let's go into those, how they kind of affect cognitive function and brain waves. And then I want to start going one by one, going through some of these other nootropic smart drugs, and then of course going into in depth into true brain. I would say coffee, nicotine, you know, caffeine, but coffee as well, you know, broadly uh, has some other psychoactive effects. Coffee, nicotine, uh, maybe alcohol. These are psychoactive. Absolutely. Is Alcohol might not be considered even a smart drug, but it certainly uh, has disinhibited some writers uh, in that example. I think smart drugs are just that. They're, 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 they're obviously drugs and they're, and they're affecting cognition. They, they affect some aspects you can quantify or at least point to as likely bottlenecks and functions such as vigilance or the ability to remain alert over time, such as response inhibition, the ability to pick from competing thoughts, competing uh, responses to change gears quickly, to be flexible. That sort of uh, response conflict, which is really a function of response inhibition. You know, and memory, sustained attention, which is really a function of vigilance, and then things like working memory, which may or may not actually be modifiable. It's a little unclear. You know, the, anything that acts on these that helps you feel more alert, more focused, works on memory, maybe other aspects of learning, uh, is a smart drug. Some of these things have some power. Obviously, caffeine, you know, the modern civilization was built on caffeine to some extent. Caffeine is largely an adenosine, uh, I believe, modifying chemical, and it keeps it active longer and has some effect on phosphodiesterase. And so there's some, there's some complex mechanisms, but essentially it's a stimulant, as, as we all know. And nicotine is more, of course, NMDA, glutamatergic, and uh, alcohol is GABAergic uh, primarily. So you know, slightly different mechanisms, but, but ultimately they modify experience and they, and they affect some aspect of cognition and we tune our experience with them. You know, we're, psych, we're, we're affecting our psychoactive sort of uh, modes. And it's, you know, it's not like these things are new. Uh, we've, uh, we've been modifying our brains since we've had them. You know, since before we were human, we probably have been, you know, drinking fermented fruit juice and eating magic mushrooms and, and uh, other, you know, various things that alter our minds. I think I think to have a mind is to is to alter it. You know, it's like you wouldn't have, wouldn't have a car and not part and not drive it. You know, but regardless, the the, the category of smart drugs is it must be you know defined as such. You know, you really this the 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 term drug it implies some impact, but but it also implies some potential a side effect. And so, caffeine definitely has a side effect, and that I think right there is is the primary distinction that. You know, people need to consider when making a foray into this world of cognitive enhancers is where is the line for safety, efficacy, side effects, likelihood it's going to benefit me, likelihood I'm going to have some, uh, you know, major hit to either a risk factor to exacerbate something else or to just empty my wallet without, you know, any potential benefit. So it's a pretty murky area, the cognitive enhancer space, you know, as, as a marketplace. Unfortunately, the word nootropic's been co-opted by marketing more than it has than by the sort of strict definition. And the strict definition of nootropic would be that it is a you know, cognitive enhancer of some sort, but it has no appreciable side effects. It's not habit forming, it's not tolerance, or, or you know, not much. And the side effects are mild and easily managed. Um, it also tends to be uh, the strict definition, the earliest definitions would say neuroprotective for damage and toxins, things like drowning and other stressors to the brain should be neuroprotected, including aging. And so when you, when you consider the must be protective, must enhance, and can't hurt sort of narrow criteria, what you, what you have to consider as a true nootropic substance really narrows down. And you know, Bradley Cooper uh, in Limitless certainly was on a smart drug, but uh, as, as uh, anyone who watched the movie may remember, uh, ridiculously habit-forming and had uh, life-ending side effects. Uh, so smart drug, not nootropic, NZT. But in the nootropic space, there are a handful of things out there, and some of them fall into you know, synthetic compounds, pure research chemical uh, categories. Some of them fall into amino acids, another natural compounds, plant-derived compounds. And then you know, there's, there's other sort of less well-understood compounds, you know, pure research chemicals that may have some effect. You know, there's sort of a trend these days for 
you know, again, for the same reason I mentioned earlier that technology is bringing things within reach, there's a trend now for the sort of elite uh, power user psychonaut to dig up a, a compound from a research paper that showed promise in mice and like have it synthesized overseas and have it shipped in and start self-experimenting. There's some of that going on these days, which is a little terrifying. Uh, because one, we aren't mice, and we, our brains don't often react exactly the same. And so, you know, but there's there's other promising compounds that that are you know in clinical trials with humans that other similar sort of psychonaut pirates have taken into the marketplace because of the likely promise. So there's some risk out there when you're entering the space. I think you need to give yourself some permission to move slowly and cautiously, and start with some very simple, very straightforward, you know, beginner nootropics, if you will. One that I always recommend, you know, if, if you overdo it, it can cause some problems. Uh, but one that I, I often recommend is called L-theanine as a first place to start. If you mix it with caffeine, I mean, most people have some sort of caffeine regimen, uh, dare I say habit. They have a relationship with caffeine of some sort, you know, a, a large number of people. And I hope it's with some form that includes other lovely antioxidants like, you know, black tea or uh, really any form of tea or uh, coffee. I hope it's not just caffeine. Uh, capsules for, for or energy drinks for folks that are listening. But if you have a caffeine or tea or some other caffeine regimen and then you add in L-theanine, uh, it modifies it and it suddenly takes it to a very nice level. And I think it brings a lot of the alpha waves back online. You know, caffeine's a stimulant, so it tends to produce beta waves and a bit suppression of theta and delta. So you become alert and awake, an enhancement of beta with caffeine. So you're processing faster and, and more to some extent, at least you're more stimulated. It's not 100% clear if you're really more ac accurate with caffeine. There are some things that change in the brain. The, the sort of inhibitory commands appear to require more neural resources when caffeine is on board. You know, you react, your brain reacts more to the no condition or the stop condition or the don't do that condition when you're trying to stop yourself or choose from some competing results. So inhibitory resources or response inhibition appears to take a little more resources when caffeine's on board, but it's not clear if it takes more resources or if you give it more resources and you just do it better. It's, it's really not cl totally clear. Um, the research is, is split because people respond widely differently to caffeine and because the research has been quite different. So it's starting to cohere around some of the more narrow features of EEG, like ERPs, which are very characteristic average evoked responses in the brain. But for ongoing EEG, EEG bands, like we've been talking about, things are always a little bit less clear because they're more individual and they're more variable. But caffeine definitely suppresses slow, increases fast. Alcohol increases slow and decreases fast brain waves. So you get more alpha, more theta, and less beta with uh, alcohol. This is why it's relaxing. It's GABAergic. It's releasing GABA, wave, uh, GABA uh, which is an alpha-promoting neurotransmitter in the brain. And then nicotine, I forget what the brainwave signatures of nicotine are. They're, they're, what, I'm t what, I, what I typically concern myself with in terms of EEG effects of substances, um, unless I'm investigating them in a research context, uh, you know, in a carefully controlled environment, clinically I tend to pay attention to how long does something affect your EEG because I'm doing assessments in QEEGs often uh, on people and caffeine you know, has a pretty big masking effect on slow brainwaves in the, in the EEG. And so you got to control for that. Nicotine's not that bad. Um, things affect the EEG and, and to some extent our, our behavior for about five half-lives of the substance. And nicotine is a very short half-life, elimination half-life. It's under an hour. And so it's only a few hours uh, at most um, that nicotine's active. And I think it's actually quite shorter than that. I'm, I'm forgetting what the actual time is. I know psychostimulants, those are about 48 to 50 hours for most of them. And so you have to control for that. Psychostimulants like Adderall, Ritalin are also in the smart drug category. And they also do things like suppress slow brainwave activity and enhance fast brainwave activity. Some other smart drugs, you know, some people might consider them smart drugs if they're anxious. Those would be considered some of the beta blockers used for blood pressure or used off-label for ADHD. Um, and those have a paradoxical effect on the EEG. Those actually enhance slow activity, but also tend to seem to enhance, uh, produce focus states. So they're doing something a little bit more subtle. We haven't figured quite out quite yet. Um, some anxiolytic drugs like Buspar, Buspirin has a paradoxical, most anxiolytics work like alcohol. They, they increase slow brain waves and, and decrease fast, but some things like Buspar will actually suppress slow brain waves and have an attention boosting effect. So there's some, you know, pharmaceutical smart drugs out there, it appears, 
and Ritalins and Adderalls and other you know, brand names like that would fit into that pharmaceutical category, and they're prescribed as such. You notice I haven't listed modafinil. It's funny. I was literally just thinking in my brain, I don't want to interrupt him, but I want to say modafinil. Yeah, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to include that in the list of things that are, that are a good idea and that are a smart drug. And there's a few reasons why. One is the effects are fairly minimal on cognition. Uh, it's mostly a wakefulness promoting agent does that by boosting histamine, it looks like, and some other, you know, uh, hypothalamic factors. It tends to, it seems to affect the, the buildup of orexin, which is involved with timing, so you stay awake longer. It seems to have a, you know, bimodal uh, window of action that's uh, 7 to 16 hours long, so you can get really long, you know, single dose effects from it. But it's really for people that are trying to stay up, they're trying to fly jets, that are trying to fight wars, that are trying not to be narcoleptic and crash cars. It's a fairly powerful substance, and um, the side effect profile is somewhat low, you know, in terms of the incidence is low, but when they occur, the side effects are life-threatening and profound uh, and dramatic, and you might not notice them until it's way too late. And, and modafinil almost killed me personally, actually, <laughs> and that's why I'm so vehemently opposed to it. So I'll say more about the side effects in a moment, but there's a couple of good early review papers on modafinil. One's called, well, the title of one which is available if you search around is called Approved and Investigational Uses of Modafinil. And if you look through that paper, you'll discover that the side effect profile, the side effect in these several different studies of, of modafinil dramatically spike when they're working on populations with ADHD because modafinil is used sometimes off-label for attention stuff by psychiatrists. And there's been some studies looking at the effects on attention. And unfortunately, the side effects go way, way up when you look at people that have attention problems. So what you need to consider is, you know, if you're going to mess with your, with your own system, it's not a smart drug. Um, the side effects that I, that I got were head-to-toe, body-covering, pressure hives, and lungs closing up for several weeks. That sounds like fun. Yeah, great fun. Days in the ER and in urgent care, weeks of steroids to keep my immune system from, you know, shutting down with histamine overload. You know, I have an ADHD brain. I'm left-handed, weirdly wired, you know, have some quirks and some skills and some deficits. Uh, I've done a lot of work on my own brain and, you know, have ADHD pretty much managed, but... Uh, modafinil just took me hard uh, to a really risky health place. Um, I didn't know the side effect profile was, you know, quite so high for ADHD people. It's several times the background rate for non-ADHD people. And so, you know, it has such a high risk for some people. And if you're somebody who's seeking enhancement, you may already have some unique or, you know, challenged or uh, some attention that's not totally under your control. And so I think the people who might self-select for seeking nootropics, cognitive enhancers, et cetera, may be disproportionately represented uh, in, in, the, in the ADHD population, or at least the impulsive or, you know, a sort of wide hunter, thinker type, you know, novelty seeking population. And I think that the, the emphasis on modafinil as a legitimate smart drug is uh, irresponsible and doing a massive disservice to people who are finding out about this drug who have some sort of ADHD risk. And you're going to end up with histamine issues and other problems you know, in, in a more than a significant fraction of people. For me, it, rules, it is ruled out because the smart drug effects, quote unquote, are weak if you're getting enough sleep, nutrition, and exercise. It's not sustainable, apparently, you know, long term, unless you have some need, you know, deep need for it. You know, you only risk side effects when you have a, a, a real problem. You have narcolepsy, modafinil is probably a good idea. You know, if you're profoundly narcoleptic and can't stay awake for minutes at a time, it can't function. But if you're not, then, you know, why would you risk side effects for such, for such small gains cognitively? Because they're just not that noticeable, especially compared with a handful of other things that are more dramatic, more accessible, legal, you know, things like nerve feedback, meditation, you know, basic nootropics. These are all more effective on, on cognition for most people than than uh, anti-narcolepsy drugs that have side effects. So I'm really, as you can tell, somewhat opposed to endorsing modafinil as a, as a rational choice in this space. I think it's, I think it's stupid. I think it's absurd. I think it's dangerous, reckless, you know. So then basically you're saying that an ADHD workaholic that's incredibly sensitive to medications like I am, modafinil is probably not the best choice. Yeah, you would probably have the, you, I mean, that, that, you sound like me, you know, really sensitive, ultra, sen ultra reactive system, you know, really low doses of everything works really well. Mm -hmm hyperactive, highly productive, you know, moving in nine directions at once, eight of them successfully. Hey, you just yeah. described me to a T. That's right? just me on a poster right there. Those are all my bullet points. Zach, I have a hunch 
that people like us, that, that, that sort of special flavor of ADHD that's a little bit burning bright is, is at least partially mediated by histamine. Mm-hmm. That's why you tend to get in that population allergies and other sort of weird, quirky sort of immune things. Right. I had all of that growing up. I've eradicated all of it, mostly through dietary changes. But yes, histamine issues, allergy issues, incredible responses to very low doses of medications growing up. Like my parents were at the point where they're like, don't even give them Tylenol. We don't know what's going to happen. Right. Yeah. So. And so I, th- that's to me, that combination, I, I have to believe there's a histamine, ADHD, phenotype. And I think that that exact you know, person is the worst person to take um, a histamine boosting agent. I'm very, very glad you brought that up then because that was one of the things that's always kind of been on my someday to-do list of, oh, maybe I'll, I'll give that one a try because it, you know, it sounds interesting. It didn't sound like it was too terribly dangerous, but it certainly sounds like for me, it's a really, really, really bad idea. And I'm certainly not flying jets. I'm not narcoleptic and I'm not a, a brain surgeon working 14 hours straight. So Yeah, and you know, you, set, you, you, you move off Often, you yes. eat well, you sleep adequately, and so now you know you have three or four other things for next generation building, including managing the the sort of filter the stress in out so you don't over maximize your you know your your Yerkes Dodgson curve so to speak. Don't don't spend all your time reacting versus choosing. Right. Um, that's one you know piece of the algorithm. The other pieces are things like. Um, meditation and neurofeedback and, uh, you know, managing carbohydrate or insulin sensitivity, really. It's really about insulin sensitivity for keeping inflammation down and keeping the brain sharp and managing other current, you know, forms of uh, nutrition, ultimately. Those are all accessible within reach. So I, I, I would say you get way more bang for the buck from, you know, buying yourself a neurofeedback kit and learning to use it than buying a couple months of an afinil. Absolutely. Well, it's good to know that. Um, I'm going to step backwards one second because um, there, there were a couple of things that I wanted to note for people. The The first one was when you were talking about caffeine and how you don't want to just take caffeine straight and you want to do it with coffee or tea or something natural. You also mentioned that if you can enhance it a little bit with a nootropa called L-theanine. Mm-hmm. And it's funny that you brought that up because I recently started drinking Chimera coffee, which mm-hmm. is a premium coffee that is infused with some of these nootropics. And I've been an advocate of Bulletproof coffee for a long time, mainly because, in stepping another further step back, the reason that I've gotten so deep into neuroscience was out of necessity because of several TBIs, traumatic brain injuries, because of severe ADHD, not being able to, to focus on things, severe depression and anxiety. So all this came out of necessity. And I've been, and I have, like you, I've completely managed it and I've learned to focus on all of the positive of things that I get from it, but I couldn't even drink a cup of black coffee. Like that would send me off the rails and the crash would completely debilitate Uh me. But then once I was introduced to Bulletproof coffee and the slow drip using the fat and the oil, that stuff works for me like a dream. To me, the best nootropic that I've still ever experienced is Bulletproof coffee with zero side effects, but all the cognitive enhancements. But then when I discovered Chimera coffee, which also has the L-theanine, the taurine, the alpha G. GPC and the DMAE. I'm not sure what, what, what that one is. I haven't heard of that one. But having those infused in the coffee, this stuff is like bulletproof coffee plus another 10%. And it's an all natural way. Like what, one thing that I really like that you said about the nootropics versus smart drugs is nootropics have very manageable, if negligible, side effects. Um, and I've been down the nootropic road for a couple of years now. I'll just kind of list off some of the ones that I've experimented with. I've done, I've done Alpha Brain, I've done Siltep. I've done True Brain recently. Obviously, that's how you and I connected. I've done Gabba Wave. I've done Unfair Advantage. And then the most recent one, um, other than True Brain, being the Chimera Coffee. And none of them gave me any adverse side effects. And like I said, I'm extremely sensitive. The most common side effect between all of them universally was just a feeling of being tired. And I know that that's fairly common. And so maybe talk a little bit about what was going on there. And then I want to start um, diving right into true brain and the idea that it is actually modifying your brain waves and you're measuring the effect that it has on cognition. Yeah. So the, the, the tiredness thing, um, every so often we, people hear, I, I hear that from other nootropic users, users, of true brain, uses of you know various types of, of compounds. It seems to be a pretty common effect. I'm not 100% sure what it is. I think that acetylcholine 
is probably being mildly overdriven by most of the nootropics, you know, compounds out there. And acetylcholine is the neurotransmitter involved with sort of memory to some extent, but but it also has a has a, an effect. I mean, you, you you really can't talk about neurotransmitters in a vacuum. They affect each other to some extent, and so things that affect memory affect attention and vice versa. So there's some sort of salience binding and some sort of a, a focus thing happening with acetylcholine. It helps you you know encode information perhaps, and of course you know as the name suggests, it's built from choline. And so this is why often there's a choline source in, in these nootropics. You know, in alpha, in alpha brain, it's alpha GPC. In true brain, it's either alpha GPC or CDP choline, depending on which version you're using. It's uh, alpha GPC and several others of those version. Um, DMAE that you mentioned is actually a choline sort of analog. It, it's used in lieu of choline, if you will. And so uh, choline is often a core of a nootropic strategy, but unfortunately, you can't just swallow, you know, choline bitartrate and choline citrate and, and malate and other forms like that because um, those molecules don't really get into the brain. They don't cross the blood-brain barrier in any, any appreciable uh, concentration. So you're just dosing choline with your body. And you often get cholinergic side effects, I believe, you know, subtle ones, uh, especially if you're doing not getting good choline absorption because um, – you know, the, the, the brain uses acetylcholine uh, in, in cholinergic neurons for encoding what I'm saying, what I've already said, memory to, to a large extent. But the body uses acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction. And so at the junction of the nerve and the muscle, you have a choline synapse, a, a, a cholinergic synapse, acetylcholine. And this causes your muscles to fire. And so if you're getting cholinergic hit to the body and not the brain, I have to believe that, that the tiredness that some people experience is simply downstream choline muscle fatigue because the muscles are being a little bit driven. I don't know. I don't have any evidence for that, but that's my, that's my, that's my theory. I also think it's possible that the brain is being uh, driven a little bit too hard in choline. But it's really, it's really interesting. The, the, the research in, in, in what is happening in many of the nootropics out there is really having a hard time finding dramatic effects. Because a lot of the nootropics that have subtle effects appear not to bind directly to any uh, receptors, any specific receptors. They appear to have indirect effects or modify you know, some cellular structures in some way that aren't receptors. And choline, you know, not only is it used to make a sort of raw material and make acetylcholine, it's also used uh, in the cell membrane. Some, some the sort of phospholipid bilayer uses phosphatidylcholine. And certain types of nootropics, CDP choline is one that is much more readily incorporated into the, the, the phosphatidylcholine mem uh, sort of membrane uptake, if you will. So the different forms of choline have different effects. And some people, I think, are more sensitive to some, and they absorb them better. Uh, and I think that the body fatigue stuff is, is, must be at least partially about that. And then another ingredient that's often a, a component of nootropic solution is a racetam, paracetam, oxyracetam, aniracetam. And those things we think uh, affect indirectly GABA and glutamate, uh, maybe acetylcholine, and they're definitely having some effect on cell structures like the cell membrane fluidity, which definitely has some you know, slightly poorly understood effect on how cells work. And when that works, you know, we get those things in your body, cells start to change a little bit. Um, we can measure them downstream, as you said, with EEG. We can see some effects. But just like we don't understand brain waves all that well, even having, you know, them be the, the sort of oldest neural signal that we've been looking at, you know, r ridiculously old technology. We've been able to, to visualize EEG since, you know, we had electricity or maybe even before by, by, by some experiments using re reflected light to get waves in the brain. But there's, this is a very old technology, but I don't understand it very well. Nootropics are also you know, not that new. The, the, the good ones, racetams, choline forms, herbal forms, amino acids like L-tyrosine, which is the, uh, you know, found in, in um, food. It's also the precursor to, the, to dopamine. So it's a salience and interest and reward neurotransmitter. These are sort of the nootropic modifiers, and I think that when you drive this stuff, you drive interest, you drive energy a little bit, you drive memory and attention. I think fatigue is not uncommon. When you maybe haven't tuned your nootropic strategy right or your nutrition isn't good, I think some people get weird issues on nootropic extracts, not because there's any direct side effect, but because they you know, might bonk their blood sugar a little bit because they're using more fuel than they realize and they aren't hydrating and feeding themselves enough. 
but I, but I think all these side effects are fairly subtle, right? I mean, the, I, I haven't really gotten dramatic reports, definitely not from true brain users of, of, of fatigue. And I've only heard incidental fatigue reports out there in the Reddit posts and communities and, you know, people who are sort of self hacking around with other substances. Um, unless you're taking, again, other things I would consider anti-nootropic, there's this, this compounds out there that people are, are trying to claim are nootropic that are not. Things like phenibut, which is another GABAergic compound that is very similar to alcohol in its effects. Things like Kratom that have both uh, stimulant and opiate effects. Um, you know, people are, are lumping these in often in more sort of more marketing drives with nootropics, and they have to be uh, careful because those are you know profoundly habit forming and have uh, you know poorly understood safety profiles and definitely understood definitely well understood or, or emerging uh, risk profiles well I, I can definitely tell you without you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that I never had fatigue or I was falling asleep it was just it, when you when you take nootropics for the first time you think you're gonna be Bradley Cooper and you think the world is gonna open up and everything's gonna saturate in color and you're gonna start writing the next great novel yeah. and then an hour later you're like huh I'm kind of tired. Okay. Yeah. Well, I didn't really, I really didn't expect that. But then what, one of the things about nootropics is that it's not, you pop a pill and all of a sudden you're Einstein. It's something that has to build up slowly over time. Yeah. And that's when you start to feel the, more of the cognitive effects, more of the focus, more of, you know, getting into the flow, getting into the zone. So let's really dig in to what true brain is and how it can actually help you enhance your cognitive function and your focus. If you're doing highly creative tasks, which is what my audience is looking to improve is being able to do creative tasks longer and better. Yeah. So, um, you know, as you said, true brain is a, a nootropic uh, blend. Uh, we, we call it a blend versus a stack, a little more elegant. We sort of have three different versions of true brain now that we're a few years in, but the original version was largely a capsule. It was, a, it was sort of an answer to a problem. I mean, I, I, I was in the middle of grad school and I discovered that my attention was, you know, my ADHD was coming back because it was largely uh, been largely eliminated through neurofeedback and some you know other other practices, but then I you know I ramped everything up dramatically in my life uh, and I found it had come back. Um, obviously, modafinil didn't work, and I was looking around for other solutions. Psychostimulants, as a slightly older guy, had stopped working. I'm I see my liver aged out of you know the candidacy for psychostimulants, but uh, I, I had known about nootropics for a long time, but never really dig, dug into them, and I was taking courses in in uh, psychopharmacology and pharmacokinetics and all kinds of interesting things and learning actually a fair amount about the brain and how some of these, these neurochemicals work. And then sort of digging into nootropics a little bit and some of the research and discovered very quickly that it, there, it was a wild west. And this was, you know, many years ago. And even back then, there was a proliferation of random compounds and chemicals and things imported in, in gray markets from, you know, random countries. And it was a little bit daunting, and I had a, you know, I was halfway through, three quarters away through a PhD in, in cognitive neuroscience, and I was having, you know, some difficulty wrapping my brain around what this stuff was. And so eventually I sort of came up with what I thought was a good first stack and, you know, share it with friends and family and refine it that way. And a couple of years later, I got involved with True Brain and helped them formulate what ended up being the True Brain 1.0. You know, we put a lot of neuroscientists in a room and didn't let them out until we had, you know, reached consensus about what we thought the best possible version of a, of a nootropic uh, blend would be. And that's, uh, you know, there's been a few minor uh, changes to the capsule format since we, we started a few years ago, but it's actually pretty close to our, to our initial formulation. If anything, it's a little bit better and it works a little better now. And it's a, it's a combination of, you know, the, the, the sort of broad nootropics that I, that I've described many of them. Um, and we, and then eventually after a couple of years, a uh, year and a half, our, our users demanded a drink and now we have a one ounce energy shot, so to speak, or we call it a think drink instead of an energy drink. And it's many of the same nootropics. And more recently we have a coffee uh, additive, which is a, you dose your coffee with a, a combination of L-theanine and alpha-GPC to modify your coffee experience. And you can buy our coffee as well. We have sort of high, you know, high end beans and a bunch of dosing sticks we'll sell you right now. Ooh, I didn't know you guys had coffee. I'm yeah, definitely jumping I, on that. 
that in because you mentioned how much you like dosed coffee. Yeah, so. I love the Chimera coffee. I absolutely love it. And I'm not a coffee drinker at all, and I have to do it bulletproof or I will go just nutty on the caffeine. I need the slow drip. But the Chimera, I've really noticed the difference. And if you guys have the same formulation or similar, I'm definitely going to try yeah, that. Coffee's called Brood, B-R-U with an umlaut and D, you know, the little joke there. And then we, we right now, we're going to change the formulation, I think, in the next couple of months. But right now it's shipping, uh, you know, a bag of beans that are really high end, quick roasted, get you quickly, you know, small, small batch, uh, small, or, you know, single origin. Uh, and then I think they ship with 20, they look like honey sticks. It's a little misleading. They're not honey sticks. What they're full of is actually a mixture of L-theanine and alpha GPC. And a couple yeah, of them. those are the jump sticks, right? Or is yeah, that what they're called? Yeah, I've, I've done those before. Okay, good. Yeah, there's the yellow ones, and there's also some red ones now that Chris uh, has in, in sort of, I think you can get them if you ask for them, and those are phenylparacetam. Mm-hmm. And yeah, those are the ones I've done are the dark yeah, red those ones. Yeah, those are pretty stimulating. I, I wouldn't consider phenylparacetam a true nootropic because it does have quick tolerance, and uh, it's a bit more of a stimulant in some ways and effects. It's not a stimulant in an in, in actual molecule, but it's it feels a little pushy. It can, it can disrupt sleep, you know, in a way that most nootropics should not be able to. And it doesn't work well, you know, three days in a row the way most nootropics do. So phenyl is a sort of ad, you know, uh, uh, ad hoc, every so often treat nootropic, if you will, versus a, a daily nootropic. But the gold sticks have just L-theanine and alpha-GPC, and the red sticks, if you will, are phenyl and, and uh, might be cetraphenazine actually, which is, you know, breaks down into choline and DMA, basically. So so, so we have a couple of the formulations of, you know, we're definitely on the coffee uh, train, so to speak. And I would love if you would, you know, grab some brood. I'm sure we can get uh, Chris or Derek or someone to send you some brood and maybe you can report back what you think if you bulletproof it and, and how, how it compares, you know, your experience. As somebody who is super sensitive and has dialed it in so carefully, I'd be interested to hear what you think of, um, you know, bulletproofing, uh, 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 one of the gold sticks. Oh my God, I would be all over that because I literally cannot touch a cup of black coffee at all. I mean, it's, it's I have had the worst experiences with coffee and I hated it until I learned about the Bulletproof method and that's kind of when my whole life completely transformed. So yeah, being able to, to dope it with these really low, you know, the, there's, there's no real stimulant in them. It just, you know, you kind of, the experience that I have is I just feel like I'm actually slowing down a little bit. I get into a flow state easier. I can kind of just snap my fingers and say, all right, 50 minutes, I'm on. I'm just going through, I'm writing, I'm editing, whatever the task is, and I get out of it and I'm fine again. So it's not like this crazy, like smoke coming out of the typewriter kind of thing where you see like <laughs> these these writers that are just downing coffee and cigarettes in the movies. Right. It's nothing like that at all. It's just this, this sense of calm focus that I will get when I work with these nootropics. Like you said, with no real side effects other than if I don't have enough glucose, because like you said, the brain is using more energy and burning more glucose, that's when I'll kind of hit that sense of being tired. And once I kind of realize that, because I'm doing a high fat, low uh, glucose diet in the morning, I have very low carbohydrates in my breakfast until pretty much lunch, I don't have any carbs. And then I realized I was doing the Bulletproof coffee, high fat, no carbs. And then I was doing True Brain an hour or two later. And I was like, oh, that's why I kind of feel the drain factor because I don't have any glucose for my brain to burn. Right. And you know, if you're, if you're getting good at sort of sipping from adipose stores, so to speak, um, and you're cycling in and out of high, low, you know, carb fat, then you end up transitioning well, but it's really difficult, really stressful. I mean, it's, it's why, why people do it to shred off the adipose in the gym is to sort of go to that, that route. But, but, but as you're right, as you, you suddenly shift glucose, unless you're a highly tuned, you know, well-fed fat burning machine, there's going to be a dip. And I think that sometimes the the ramp up that we get metabolically from nootropics may actually overwhelm even sort of well-tuned metabolisms a little bit as you get used to it. Sure. And this, of course, is different across different nootropics. You know, we, 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 sort, of, we sort of tuned, if you will, true brain to really try to hit the sweet spot. Um, and that's, you know, I, I know we want to get into the ingredients. That's really why we added all of the things that are in true brain is to take the one-two punch of a choline, a really good choline source, and a racetam, and take those two things and eliminate some of the inter-individual variability, the, the sort of odd results where some person gets, you know, the windshield wiper fairy and crystal clear vision and verbal fluency and, you know, lots of really great sort of subtle but, but really good effects. And other folks are like, never felt anything. It's a placebo. And so, you know, I, I thought a lot about why that was happening. And, and we, we ended up putting into True Brain all, uh, uh, a lot of the other ingredients are there to buffer the likelihood that someone's going to respond too much or too little 
to a typical racetam approach. And so with CDP choline in the capsules uh, or alpha GPC in um, I think in the sticks, sticks might actually be CDP at this point. We've, we've gone back and forth. And then the racetam, paracetam or oxyracetam in the capsules or drinks, you're, you're getting a really nice support to your culinary system, even though we don't necessarily know in the literature why. We do see some brainwave differences. I've, I've definitely done some quantification you know, myself, and there are some things in the literature that, that, that show from choline and racetam sources. Some of the first racetam literature shows that it increases the complexity of microstates, which more chaos in the EEG, which, is, which doesn't sound good, but it actually is good. The more states the EEG can move into quickly, the more you have com- complex brain activity. So it's, a, it's um, you know, chaos in the EEG is a good thing. Chaos in the heart is a bad thing. Uh, just to give you another little bit of neuroscience, because I know you'll geek out on this, Zach, the, the neurons in the brain and the heart aren't all that different. They're, they're fairly similar types of cells, and they actually have similar regulatory constraints. But they act very differently. And you, you've, of course, seen an EKG. It's a very regular wave. It's, it's many cells all firing perfectly in synchronous order, um, very tightly controlled. But the brain, brain waves are very chaotic and random, and they're, they're you know, variable and, and messy. And essentially, they're operating at different ends, opposite ends of the regulatory stability phase space. And so you have the same kinds of parameters and kinds of cells or, or even equations, you can think of them. But on one set of the way they're regulating, regulating one set of, of modes they can be in, they're chaotic and once that they're ordered. So through that logic, when the heart, when the EKG looks like EEG, you're having a heart attack. And when the EEG looks like the EKG, you're having a seizure. Yeah, I was ba- I was going to guess I didn't actually know the answer, but I was going to guess you're probably either catatonic or yeah. which is essentially like with a seizure you are I guess in a way catatonic, you're not you're not immobile, but you basically seized up and nothing's happening and that would have been my guess. Yeah, having two organized EEG, a spike discharge, a single spike is an ictal event like that is the is the onset of a massive spike storm essentially. Yeah, exactly. Um so as far as the true brain is concerned, now that we have a really clear idea of the mechanism in the brain. We know about the ingredients. Now give me the two-minute marketing elevator pitch for what True Brain can actually do for the casual user that just says, I just, I, I'm down in the five-hour energy. I feel like crap. I know it's not good for me. It's not good for my liver. What the heck can True Brain do for me? So True Brain is designed to support cognitive output, to keep you f- focused, to keep you performing longer and to help you overcome cognitive fatigue, to keep firing longer, so to speak, and to get through your day. You know, we 20 years ago, we had the ability to add an extra few hours to our day and get ahead in the world. Today, we don't. Every moment is scheduled. And so what we need to do is get more out of our day, get more productivity, stay focused longer, manage interruptions better, get into that flow state, and use an algorithm of productivity to really manage your own resources and keep them maximal. And to that end, we, you know, we think TrueBrain is the best solution for supporting long-term day in, day out as a regimen. It's not a spot intervention. It's a regimen to support brain health performance. It's designed to do these things and to keep you functioning well long-term. So the sort of moral pitch is that you have power over your brain in lots of ways. Everything from what you eat to what you learn to how you meditate to what you, how you sleep to how you move. You also have power over you know, the organ, you can feed the brain through things like nootropics and, and other, other, you know, information feeds the brain, complexity of, of knowledge and experience. You know, new environments feed the brain and can make you, you know, can be nootropic as well. Uh, in fact, hippocampal plasticity, for instance. But the, the elevator pitch is that it can help you get more out of your moments because you're, 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 you're firing better in them. You're on more. Um, it makes good brains better, hopefully, is is the idea. So that having been said, I really want to encourage my audience to not be so terrified about the idea of trying something that might or might not end up being the limitless drug. Because like we talked about, nootropics are going to have far less side effects than something like a cup of coffee or downing five-hour energy or even drinking three Cokes a day to stay awake. That's infinitely more dangerous for you than trying something like a nootropic, especially like True Brain. And I do my research. I do not do anything crazy or risky whatsoever because I'm so sensitive. And like I said, I've had a good experience with True Brain 
So if you want to, you can learn more about it. Just go to fitnessandpost.com slash truebrain, and that's T-R-U-B-R-A-I-N. Kind of funny that, you know, brain scientists spelled the word true wrong, but whatever. <laughs> um, and the, the cool thing is you guys have been gracious enough to give my listeners a coupon code. So you can get 25% off any order at True Brain by just using the code fitness non case sensitive. So that is awesome that you guys did that for me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, we're happy to. So that having been said, this has been just a terrific, total geeked out deep dive into brain science. And I'm walking away knowing even more about how this crazy thing inside my skull works and how I can manage it better for creative focus and just mental stamina and just being able to function, like you said, in this ridiculous world that we have devised in the 21st century where we never have any downtime. We are on 24 seven. And th this stuff helps. It's all high bandwidth. Think about, you know, I mean, how old are you, Zach? If, I'm, if I may ask, you wanna just- 36. Okay, so you're old enough to have lived in a time when you weren't flooded with information from from multiple screens constantly. Oh yeah, I, I remember getting the internet and getting email my junior year of high school and I didn't have a cell phone until my sophomore year of college. Totally dating myself, yeah. but yes, I know what the old world felt like. I know what my brain felt like in that world and I've gone through that transition and this is totally tangential, but having small kids now, we're the first generation in the history of evolution to raise kids that are surrounded by the internet and Facebook and Netflix and all these devices, we have no roadmap for how to manage it. And that's why I'm looking into these different types of substances and just any way to manage focus and creativity because the world is just so overwhelming. And if we think it's bad now, wait 10 years, wait until virtual reality takes over. You think scanning through Facebook now is distracting <laughs> and hearing the ding of your email is distracting. Wait a decade. If people don't learn how to manage their environment, learn how to manage their focus and learn how to eliminate distractions, we are going to be destroyed over the next decade, which is I why- I have to believe, Zach, just to continue the tangent, I have to believe that part of what that technology will bring us is the ability to create environments that are not distracting. That is a really good point. I'd never looked at it that way. And I very, very much hope that all the people designing those worlds are thinking about that. I just, I'm not sure about it. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. So that having been said, it has been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for all the work that you've done and for creating True Brain. It has definitely made a difference for me, and I hope that it makes a difference for my audience and my listeners. So once again, fitnessandpost.com slash truebrain, T-R-U-B-R-A-I-N, to learn all about it and use coupon code fitness for 25% off. So thank you, sir. My pleasure, Zach. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to episode 75 of the Fitness and Post podcast. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to access any of the resources discussed, visit our show notes at fitnessandpost.com 75. After listening to this episode, if you're interested in giving one of True Brain's products a try, you can visit our special link, fitnessandpost.com slash truebrain, and use the code fitness for 25% off your first order. That's fitnessandpost.com slash T-R-U-B-R-A-I-N. Note the spelling of the word true. As a reminder, if you'd like to become a beta member for my online course, Move Yourself, enrollment will be closing this Friday, April 8th at midnight Pacific time. To learn more, just visit fitnessandpost.com slash optimize. And if you're listening to this after April 8th and you'd still like more info, you can visit that same link and get yourself on the waiting list. Thank you for listening. Be well.